Okay. So uh, it's a great segue to my talk. And I was asked, are my slides visible now? Yes. yes. So it's a great uh, pleasure to follow up uh, with Nita. And it's always, uh, I'm in a tough spot between Dr. Deshpande and Dr. Makkar. So I'm the, the, the bread or the butter between the, in the sandwich. But uh, let's, that's why I've got the nutrition talk. We'll talk about the nutritional manipulations for obesity, prediabetes, and diabetes. And uh, this is, of course, certainly very important and something that needs to be done. So at the very outset, I don't have any financial disclosures for this talk. We all know this was, this uh, made the headlines and keeps on making the headlines that one in five in India is obese or overweight. And maybe those numbers are changing, increasing or decreasing. But certainly this is a problem that we are all going to be dealing with no matter what the specialty is. So let's start off just with a background case. We have this 36 year old gentleman whose BMI is 28. So he's overweight. For the last two years, he's remained pre-diabetic and he has a very strong family history of diabetes and heart disease. And of course, he's worried because he's been trying lifestyle changes on and off. As Nita said, rightfully, you cannot sustain them. So he is highly worried about developing not only diabetes, but also heart disease or other complications. So of course, he, this is what he has been doing. He has been going online and Googling and doing crash diets, finding some different kinds of diets. He has tried every possible diet but his weight always manages to bounce back. So he's very, very concerned as to what is going to happen. So what I show over here is, as you can see at a BMI beyond 27 to 28, suddenly the risk ratio of developing diabetes exponentially doubles. So obesity is the main driver of type two diabetes and certainly of other correlated conditions such as blood pressure, dyslipidemias and heart disease. And of course, reducing obesity, we know, will help to reverse, prevent, or at least reduce the progression to all these illnesses. So he's in the right place. His mind is in the right thought that he needs to do something. Lo and behold, he reads about this particular study, the direct trial. Is this a brighter future for people who have type 2 diabetes, where in patients lost tons of weight, if they lost more than 15 kilograms, they almost reverse their diet? diabetes, I'm sorry. So he is very excited and wondering if this is something he needs to be doing. But then comes the second part of the study where it says that you had to lose this 10 to 15 kilos and you had to maintain that. Otherwise, your remission could go away. So now he is confused. What does he do when he comes to see you? He's really concerned because he really needs some help and guidance. As a good physician, I would suggest when you have your patients waiting for you in clinic, just have a simple form for them to fill out as to what have they been eating in the last 24 hours or two days. You can ask them to write down their weekly activity level. And so when they come to see you, you don't have to waste too much time trying to understand what they are doing. Here's what he's doing. So as you can see, this is our Indian diet. For breakfast, he has a South Indian meal. For lunch, he might have a complete roti sabzi dal. He might be having, uh, this is a Gujarati thali. This is what it looks like. And as you can see that an average Indian diet can go minimally on the lower end up to 250 grams per day, as was shown by the START study as well. And dinner yeah, could be one meal or two meals, one with friends, one with homes. And so it's very confusing for our patients as to which one should they skip? What do they do? Portion control is not working. It's not sustainable for them. And the direct trial says, oh, you need to replace one meal and make it look like this. Now, how many of us are ready to do this and continue doing it for the rest of our life? It's not a diet, as I tell my patient. It's a mindset. You need to be ready to change. And this is something you are doing for nobody else, for yourself. So what works? What works? Is it just simply reducing the calories? Is it changing the macronutrients, the kind of food you are eating? Or is it both and you need to understand truly like a graduation what you're doing and moving on with this? So how important is medical nutrition therapy? Is it calories versus meal composition? And how do we apply it when you see your patients? I have some articles I'll point you to where you can go and read about mechanisms and what Nita showed you in the pathophysiology, how diet may help to reverse that. So let's just for a few minutes first talk about the data we have for prediabetes and insulin resistance. So we know that the reason we worry about prediabetes is that patients can progress from normal glucose tolerance to frank diabetes. And therefore, it's very important to identify this very early on and make sure that we can prevent this progression from happening. 
In order to do this, we need to understand that patients who may be born with a genetic predisposition, coupled now with obesity, which leads to insulin resistance, not only do they have glucotoxicity, but also lipotoxicity, which at the level of the beta cell is going to be the driving factor or the dynamic factor that will perpetuate that you develop type 2 diabetes. We also now know from the ominous octet that it's not as simple as we used to think. It's not simply an insulin glucose ratio imbalance. There are several different players. Nita has shown you some of them. We still believe that losing your beta cell function may be the moving part that causes progressive beta cell dysfunction or loss. And hence, our therapies have switched from being glucose-centric to being more complication-centric. And also, as you can see, weight is pivotal and hence a pathophysiology-based sound approach. Nita already spoke about this, the genetic and the epigenetic influences, which can lead to serious variations in body weight and also related diseases. This talk could not be complete without saying that gut microbiota manipulation is important. If you were to remember something you can see over here, these are healthy gut bacteria. These are the dysbiotic gut bacteria. Whenever you are eating way too much, your gut becomes permeable. Or if you're eating the wrong kind of food leading to edema inside your intestine, this permeable intestinal mucosa will allow your endotoxins to go into the circulation, which causes release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and the whole adiposity insulin resistance pathway. What are those foods? High fat, high sugar diet, stress, and also several of our antibiotics. And if you can prevent yourself from doing this, look at this healthy diet, lifestyle, prebiotic, probiotic, and finally fecal transplantation, you can change your gut microbiota. I won't spend much time on here. So the lifestyle studies that we know about, we know that they all say you need to lose weight about 5 to 10% with long-term maintenance if you want to prevent the progression from prediabetes to diabetes. The most uh, unique study, of course, that we have is your intensive lifestyle intervention, the diabetes prevention program, where 3,000 patients almost were given either lifestyle intervention versus metformin versus placebo. And as you can see, with the lifestyle intervention, there's almost a 60% reduction in progression from IGT to type 2 diabetes, versus in metformin alone. The dose over here, I just want to point out, is 850 milligrams twice a day. The reason being, in the next slide, I show you the Indian diabetes program, which was done by Dr. Ramachandran's group, wherein the metformin dose is much lower, and lifestyle and metformin did about the same, about 25 to 30% prevention in progression from IGT to type 2 diabetes. So this is very nice. This is good to keep in mind that in our Indian population, we could use the lifestyle prevention arm. And this was not a very intensive lifestyle interval. I decided that we should, since I'm talking on nutrition, I'll dig deeper into these trials. And what you see over here is the breakdown. So in the Indian Diabetes Prevention Program, all they asked the patients to do, these were not very well-to-do patients. These were farmers living in villages, walking to work, you know, local people, they were asked to simply avoid refined carbs. Their total calorie intake was reduced and the total fat was reduced to less than 20 grams per day. And isn't that amazing? As you can see, in, so with such a simple change, they still had a 30% reduced risk. And similar thing is seen across the board in most of the other bigger studies, which is the Finnish diabetes study, as well as the Ducking, which is also an Asian study. And the predictors of diabetes incident looking, doing a multivariate analysis, higher physical activity, lower percent fat intake were correlated at a p-value of 0.5 and 0.4. But the strongest predictor was weight loss. And hence, we maintain till date that weight loss has a p-value of less than 0.001 with a hazard ratio of 0.42. So almost a 60% chance of progressing, prevention of progression of diabetes. And finally, I just bring to you, it doesn't matter what meal plan you follow. Sticking to the plan is more important than any other meal plan. So here I show the Atkins diet, the zone, the Weight Watchers. So just a, you know, kind of a strike on all the uh, fat diets. Not only does this affect your, di your diabetes, but we also know that as your weight goes down, the waist circumference and your blood pressure, so other parameters of the metabolic syndrome get better. 
Similar effects were seen in the gestational diabetes women, which was a subgroup from the diabetes prevention program. So it's important to do this also. Again, uh, cumulative incidence of diabetes over four years in the Finnish diabetes study and in the Asian patients with IGT is also seen. So I end the, the, the pre-diabetes part of this with the guidelines available to us that the ADA also has recommendations for healthful eating patterns and using food in portion control sizes, not only to achieve glycemic and body weight control, but also to prevent complications. I am glad to uh, just say that I was part of this international guideline. This was released this year. So we have put forth uh, my, our working group two guidelines this year, one for the management of insulin resistance, and the second one, which has just been released last week for the management of the obese type 2 diabetic. So along with Dr. Muskogiri and Dr. Kalau's group, uh, uh, my name is right over there. So we, this is available to us. I'll simply just go through some of the salient features wherein we say that it's not just reducing calorie intake, but the quality of diet will also matter. Low glycemic index foods, plant-based high carbohydrate, high fiber diet, will certainly help more in improvement in markers of insulin resistance. Also, a role has been evidenced now in the short term under supervision for a low carbohydrate diet, both for diabetes and pre-diabetes. As far as protein goes, using protein about as, at 25 to 30% of your total daily energy intake. And here is key, the preferred protein is not animal source, vegetable source was shown to improve insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance with lower um, body weight. Lean body mass was improved. Fasting insulin and HOMA IR were also improved. Now here's the kid on the block or the new kid or the we should not forget is dietary fiber. You need to make sure your patients are getting at least 25 grams per day for women and averagely 38 grams per day for women. And this should be coming from vegetables, whole grains. And this is very, very important. So I've just tried to highlight more details of all the mechanisms that are, are uh, explained in our paper. We also have other guidelines. I'm just kind of highlighting the ones that I really think are useful is the ACE guideline, which talks about nutrition, physical activity, sleep, behavior component, as well as smoking cessation. So all of this will go hand in hand. And again, I like this because they talk about that you need to keep the patient at goal. We're not trying to simply improve an HbA1c. We also look at the risk factors. We look at if they're eligible for weight loss therapies. We want to prevent patients from progressing to overt diseases. Now a quick switch of gears and I'll end the talk in the next five minutes with a few minutes on diabetes. And of course, no talk on diabetes will be complete without mentioning the look ahead research study that was developed as an intensive lifestyle intervention to see if there was an effect on CV mortality. A nice study, 5,000 patients, 1,200 to 1,800 kilocalories per day with increased physical activity, low fat diet and a meal replacer. This was what they used. So in most of our cardiac studies, low fat is the keyword that you will find. However, we now know that the Mediterranean diet, which is moderate fat, as long as it's good quality of fat using the unsaturated fats, works very well and much better and is promoted for cardiac risk prevention. I just thought I would show a few things about low carbohydrate beyond glycemic control. So in this particular study, you can see that lowering the carbohydrate intake shows glycemic benefits, of course, most certainly. But here's what I show you, that in the low carbohydrate diet, using foods with a lower glycemic index, reducing total percentage carb. Now, if you gave them low carb and low glycemic index, it had significant improvement even on kidney function. Certain markers have been looked at as well as on the GFR. Now, 10 year CHT risk increases with a high carbohydrate diet. So Dr. Akira's group has looked over here and they divided groups based on the average carbohydrate intake and the higher carb intake at a higher CHD risk at the end of 10 years. Now, what I really liked is this particular study that even over here, what they have shown. So on the top panel, you have the relative risk for total mortality and at the bottom, you have major cardiovascular disease. And what they show you at the bottom is this is total fat, saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, polyunsaturated, and carbs. 
So no matter what the fat content in the diet was, you can see the mortality is going down. It doesn't matter even if they were eating the bad stuff, the fatty saturated fats. The minute you give them carbs, you can see this graph is going up. Total mortality and CV disease was increasing. So simple story, carbs somehow, especially bad quality carbs. And this is from the PURE study, which is a really nicely done study. So moving along, we need to identify for our patients based on their cultural beliefs, what will work for them. And we need to give them a nutrition prescription. If they can take medications for the rest of their life, certainly they can follow a dietary guideline or a lifestyle change for the rest of their life if we can guide them appropriately. So you can see over here that weight loss, A1C reduction, low carb and very low carb diets seem to target most of these factors, including cholesterol, blood pressure. So this is important to keep in mind. The Mediterranean diet also, as you can see, works very well for CVD risk along with diabetes uh, reduction risk. So emphasize non-starchy vegetables, lots of vegetables. Minimize added sugars and refined grains chose whole foods over highly processed foods. And this might be a simple thing to guide them. And you could have pictorial guides in your clinic to hand out. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Okay. So lastly, this is the other guideline I was talking to you about. We have a nutritional management of type 2 diabetes. And I just wanted to show you the mechanisms. This is in our paper also. So what happens when you give them a low carbohydrate diet, including the low GI foods, which is a low glycemic index food, it helps to reduce HbA1c, glucose variability, and has been shown in several studies to improve beta cell function. Reducing saturated fatty acids and trans fatty acids and increasing the UFAs, which is your unsaturated fats, leads to a reduction in intestinal lipopolysaccharide production, which will lead to a reduction in intestinal permeability. This is the gut microbiome I was talking about with a reduction in metabolic endotaxemia, increased intestinal alkaline phosphatase production, and a positive gut microbiome. Using plant-based protein sources to up to 25 to 30% will again help in reducing fat mass. Dietary fiber. So these are the key four things I want you to keep in mind. 25 grams per day for female, 38 grams per day for male, preferred in a viscous and readily fermented form. And this is my last slide. So this would all lead to an improvement in body weight, insulin sensitivity, reducing inflammation, so effects beyond diabetes control. We have several areas of consensus and uncertainty. The agreement is for most of us that a 5 to 10% weight loss should be achieved. Whatever dietary intervention is taken, you need to follow up just like you do with your medications. We have several other guidelines, European, the Indian guidelines, which are more consistent that we need at least 50% carbs in our diet and consensus is on foods to avoid. So with this, I'll end my slide and uh, I'll be more than happy to say that Mr. A needs to make the switch whenever he's ready. Maybe if not just a shake, he could have at least a big bowl with whole foods. Thank you very much for your attention.